I would never have made it to Stonehouse if it wasn't for my helicopter. <laughs> but before I start, I just want to say one very simple thing about Bob Crow. The, the left have lots of people that can make a good speech. We can never have enough people that win for working people. And that's why I think Bob Crow is an important figure for us not to forget. Because he could talk, but he could win. And it's time that we started winning. The reason it's time we started winning is because we've been losing for far too long. There was one day last year, and I'm going to sit down with my calendar and try and work out exactly when it was, but there was one day last year when the time that Britain spent building up its welfare state was overtaken by the time that Britain has spent undoing its welfare state. From 1945 to 1979, we built a country which was decent. Decent for the people, the working people that lived in it. We built a welfare state. We changed the economy. We tackled poverty seriously. We tackled poor housing seriously. We changed the lives of the people of this country for good. And since 1979, everything we did, nationalization, getting rid of means testing, universalism, public services investment, making sure that there's good quality rental housing for people, all of those things have been consistently undone ever since which is why I get so sick to the back teeth of another pious lecture from somebody in Better Together telling me to stay in Britain so that the broadest shoulders can carry the burden. The only burden the broadest shoulders seem to me to be carrying is bags full of money. Because I can't see what the hell they're contributing to the lives of the vast majority of people in this country just now with their tax dodging and their lack of participation and the way that they distort the political process. It's no good enough. We've all come to believe that it's normal, that it's usual, that it's like this. Well, let's have a look and see what normal actually looks like and how normal Britain is. So, a working person in Britain, they will be in the third, sorry, the second lowest paid economy of all the advanced economies in the world. They will have, they'll be working the third longest hours of anyone in Europe. And of all the countries in Europe, there's only three countries where the wages of a working person have fallen faster since the economic crisis than in Britain. If you're a woman, you're in a country with the eighth biggest gap between male and female earnings. You're paying the highest cost for childcare. If you're a pensioner, you've got the lowest pension in Europe and you're the third most likely to be in poverty. If you're a child, you will be in the country where children in a WHO survey came absolutely bottom of the league table of developed nations for happiness. That's the reality of what we created with this Britain that we've been building for the last 35 years. That Britain is based on the belief that only the biggest and the strongest have any right to win. And if they win, the rest of us ought to be glad. If you put two people in a room in Britain and one of them comes out alive, that person must be the best that we can possibly have. And it's destroying our society and it's destroying our lives. And we can't stand about any longer looking at this and saying it's all right. Because one of the other things that Britain does is it tries to make you believe that that's how it is and there's nothing we can do anymore. Oh, it's a global trend. Oh, it's an international uh, phenomena that are causing this. It's not. I've just shown you in a few simple statistics how bad Britain is compared to everybody else. How poor life is in Britain for ordinary working people compared to even countries like Bulgaria and Romania where the pension's better than ours. They've got happier kids than us in these countries. You're less likely to end up in pension or poverty if you live in Estonia than you are here. So it's time we woke up to the reality of what Britain has become. And it's also time that we woke up to the reality of what Scotland could be. Now, one thing I'm going to say here, Britain could be this too. Britain could turn itself round if there was even a modicum of the will among the politicians in Britain to do anything about it. But there isn't. Because they're all bought into one belief that a political philosophy that says let the biggest win is the only way that you can move forward as a society. It's not. You can have me first politics. We've had me first politics for 40 years and we all came second. It's time that we had politics that put all of us first and that's what Commonweal's about. So how do you do it? Because I want to focus everybody's mind on one question which is We've heard a lot about the kind of country, and I'm wabbling my fingers about like this because it all seems hell of a vague to me, the kind of country of fairness and decency that everyone says they want to have. I hear very little from the other side about what that actually entails, what you're actually going to do to make that country happen. And so I'm going about every meeting that anyone invites me to come to to say the following things. We know what the people say they want from their lives. We know what we need to do to give them that. We have all the knowledge and the expertise in this country that we need. 
We have all the resources and all the wealth in this country to do that that we need. And we have, in my view, an absolutely strong and undeniable political majority that means if we can get our country back, who's going to stop us from doing these things? So what do people say they want? Meaningful work. I mean, this is so important. Meaningful work, not the money. The sense that when you get up in the morning and you go to your work, you can feel proud about yourself because you're doing something worthwhile. A home, somewhere to live, somewhere nice to be. Security, the knowledge at the end of the month you can feed your family, that you can pay your bills. Your health, a sense of community, a sense that you're living with people that care, that you can care about, that you're part of something. That is more or less all that people say they want. And why can they not have it? Because it's too expensive, apparently. Too expensive. You can't afford the public services, the social investment, the, the economy which would give them this stuff. We can't afford it. Well, we bloody can. And I'll tell you how we can. We can by being not the lowest paid, second lowest paid economy among the advanced economies. So some of you have heard me say this before. Imagine what a decent salary that would let you have that life is, that meaningful work, that home, that security. Uh, you know, you can play your, pay your bills, you can participate, you're not relying on tax credits. What would that salary be? 25,000 to 35,000 pounds? Well, of everybody in Scotland today who's working, only one in five earns between 25,000 and 35,000 pounds. Three out of five working Scots earn less than 25,000 pounds a year, and half of everybody in working Scotland at the end of this year won't have made 21,000 pounds. We wonder why we can't afford our public services when we've got people that can't afford to live without tax credits. We've got a low pay economy. And if it wasn't like that, it would be substantially different for all of us. We've got a paper on our website. Um, I always forget to tell people the websites. Readfoundation.org is where you'll find all of our, our papers. And the Commonweal website is allofusfirst.org, where all those papers are translated into language, which is perhaps a little easier to understand. Some of them are quite technical. But we took this paper and we said, let's try and find out what this low pay economy means to everybody. And we said, let's not imagine that we've grown the economy. The economy gets no bigger, but we distribute the wages in that economy fairly in the way that they do in a Nordic country. So we took away the massive pay at the top, we got rid of the low pay in the middle, we compressed the pay so it was flatter, and we got the number of people into work that you have in a Nordic country, the low levels of unemployment. We did just that, and we ran the tax model again, and it generates four billion pounds of additional income without touching tax rates. We don't have a problem with too much public expenditure, we have a problem with too low wages in the pockets of our people. And why? <laughs> And why is that? Because we allow this conflict model, this bully model, to be the dominant model of everything that we do. So if somebody can build a shed in a field and buy lots of cheap uh, retail goods from China and fill that shed and sell them to you, and if in the process that out-of-town shopping centre can close down all your high streets, you should be glad. You should be delighted because the biggest guy won and that's what's good for you. Or if you're a youngster, Try to get, in, get your, on the property ladder, buy your first house. You'll presumably be delighted that seven out of the ten richest people in this country are property developers who got rich by controlling the land on which houses are built to push house prices higher and higher so that they get rich and you don't. Or perhaps you'll be delighted at our banking sector, which we've even found now. I, I've got to say the Libor scandal was, was horrendous, but there's something almost worse to discover that some of our banks were deliberately bankrupt in small businesses so that they could sell off their assets for a rapid profit. I mean, I find that truly genuinely disgusting. We've got an economy which makes its money from your pockets because retail doesn't make value, it just takes value from you. And property doesn't make value, it takes value from you and your rents. And the banking sector hasn't been making value, it's been taking value out of you through exploitation. And all these jobs, all these wealth grabbing jobs, uh, in, in industries. They don't create good jobs because you don't need skills to do any of these things. If you're using an exploitative economy in which all you've got to do is put a Chinese t-shirt on a shelf and get somebody to buy it for twice the price you paid for it, you don't have to pay anybody because that's not skilled. It's an extremely useful industry if you want to make yourself a lot of money in your corporation, and it's an absolutely rubbish industry if you want to feed your family. And we need to change that. We need to build an economy which is not based on low play, exploitative 
jobs, but which is built on high pay productive jobs because Britain is a country in denial about its economic situation. We are 16 percentage points behind the average productivity of an advanced economy. We have desperately low rates of innovation. Our balance of trade is terrible. These old measures of economic health, productivity, how much you make, balance of trade, how much you sell, innovation, how much better you get, these measures don't even get discussed in Britain now. All we talk about is an economy based on high street footfall and house prices. It's madness. We have got to get out of this corrosive, psychotic system which measures your success by how well the rich do, how well the corporations do, how well the big do. That's no future for us. That's no future for any of us. We have to build a productive economy. Because when you make things, and when you do things, and when you create the value in your economy, not simply by marking up what something else did, but through what we do, what we build with our hands, then suddenly that economy is an economy where you pay people. Because when you make value, and when you create things, and when you build things, it's your skill that adds the value. It's the worker's skill that makes the wealth in the economy. And when it's skill that creates wealth, you pay people because they're worth paying. We have to move from one economy to another, and the city of London will never let us do it. It is not good enough for anybody down there to say, oh, we'd like to have a high pay economy, or we'd like to have a productive economy, because even if they were serious, they wouldn't get the permission from the city of London. But we can here. We have to do what people do when they want to change their economy and make it better. We need an industrial policy. We know a policy that says the economy is not beyond democracy, something you can't touch, something you have to sit and you have to accept and that's it. We can put in place an industrial policy which says no, our economy is part of our society and our society is a democratic society and if we want to have a high pay economy, no corporation is going to tell us we're not allowed to try. So what we have to do there's no time. There's no time to talk about this. The industrial policy paper in itself is, is insanely big. Um, what we have to do is put in place the, the things which will help that economy to grow, a national investment bank. We've got to use procurement to build up um, big, strong industries. We need to support small independent industries in this country and stop allowing the big manufacturers, to put the big retailers to put them out of business. We have to start investing because this is another shocking fact. Britain, if you take all the investment that's been made in Britain just now, that's public and private private sector, all of it, it's not even zero. Now that sounds like it's, that sounds impossible. No, but it is. The, the rate at which the infrastructure, public and private infrastructure of this country is declining is faster than the rate that we're investing in it. If Scotland becomes independent, we need to invest five billion pounds a year just to get to the European average of the investment in our economy. And my God, that can't be our, uh, our only hope to be average. We have to start investing in this country and we have to do it properly because that austerity agenda, which tells you you can't borrow, you've got to live within your means, is a lie. No, we shouldn't be running deficits. Deficits are bad. I don't support Gordon Brown's use of borrowing to cover a faulty economy which wasn't given enough money to sustain public services. That's bad. We must get out of deficit on our revenue expenditure. But that's not the same thing as saying that for the long term we borrow because it works. And it does work. Every period when Britain's had its best economic outcomes, we were borrowing to invest. So whether that's a national company borrowing heavily to invest in housing, but based on the income that those houses are going to produce in rent over the next 50 years. Or whether it's borrowing for a national energy company, which is going to repay that borrowing through the guaranteed income that you get from energy generation. We're still going to be needing electricity over the next 20 years. That income is guaranteed. So the question is, do you want a foreign multinational company to capture all of that wealth on the basis of buying cheap turbines from China? Or are we going to bring it back here? Are we going to own our grid? Are we going to build our own energy infrastructure? make our own turbines, make our own energy storage facilities and um, generation capacity in this country with our hands because we can borrow to do that with no difficulty. There is no question that we will be able to repay anything that we borrow to do that. There are tens of thousands of extremely high quality jobs for people if we can just do these things. So if we can create a productive economy, if we can create that economy, we can create good jobs, and good jobs pay well. Jobs that pay well create prosperous citizens, 
Prosperous citizens pay their taxes, and that makes strong public finances, which we can invest in infrastructure and public services, which create the strong social cohesion that creates the country that people say they want to live in, a country that cares for each other, where you're part of a, part of a community with your neighbour. We can do all these things. There is a model which delivers this. Now, later this week, on Thursday, we've got a conference with well over 100 academics. It is insane, but we are trying to get a full 50 major reports out before this referendum. We're about halfway there. These reports cover everything from tax and spend to budgeting to finance to housing, all the way through to social policy and how we treat our children. It's a full programme for the transformation of Scotland. We are going to have these 50 papers ready for early May when we're going to write them up as one simple story which says anyone that says you that this is anyone that tells you that this is as good as it gets wrong. Here's a tale, here's a story which will explain to you how we get from this place to somewhere better. So don't come back to me and tell me that only the broader shoulders of Britain is the option that we've got for transforming this country. And I can only say it again. 50 years, 40 years of me first politics, and Nene has won, and I'm sick of losing, and I'm sick of watching other people lose. I am not going to stand around waiting for Labour to get its act together and shake us all up in Britain like they promised they're going to do every five minutes and then roll straight back from five minutes later. If we can't change it... <laughs> if they won't change it, we have to. Because this is a, com a democracy, and if this is what we want, we can take it. So we have all the knowledge about what our people want. We have all the expertise to give them it. We have all the resources in this country necessary to make it happen, and we have an absolutely firm democratic majority to put that in place. The only thing that we need to create that Commonweal Scotland is the capacity to do it. We need a yes vote to have the powers, and if we do, we can transform this country. It can be a country that puts all of us first. Thank you.